I thus address the world through the medium of the latest wonderful invention, so that my voice, like my great show, will reach future generations and be heard centuries after I have joined the great, and as I believe, happy majority. Welcome to Becoming Barnum, the journey to fame and fortune, a podcast presented by the Barnum Museum in Bridgeport, Connecticut, and based on their award-winning blog series. Support for this project is presented to the Barnum Museum from the City of Bridgeport American Rescue Plan Act Funds, Peoples United, a division of M&T Bank, and the Connecticut Humanities and National Endowment for the Humanities as part of the Federal American Rescue Plan Act. The Barnum Museum has a special treasure in its collection, a 750-page copybook of letters written by Phineas Taylor Barnum when he was traveling in Europe in the 1840s, introducing his young protege, General Tom Thumb, to high society and royalty, as well as millions of ordinary people. Barnum's lively letters to friends, family members, and business associates reveal him more completely as a person at times struggling mightily to make the three-year tour a success, all the while directing the management of his American museum from afar. They also offer insights into Barnum as a husband, father, and nephew, and as a mentor to the child actor-entertainer whose popularity resulted in their meteoric rise to fame and fortune. In his mid-30s at the time, Barnum proved himself a tireless go-getter, calculating risk-taker, and astute entrepreneur decades before his name was attracting crowds to the greatest show on earth. These letters offer a window into the hard-scrabble era of show business, revealing how Barnum went about acquiring, hiring, and commissioning attractions, and promoting his museum and the general Tom Thumb tour in Europe. Join us as we travel back in time to learn through Barnum's own words about the real person behind the legendary P.T. Barnum. Souvenir medals and a snug saloon to draw and read in. One of the things Adrian St. Pierre, curator of the Barnum Museum, did as she read through Barnum's letters from France in his 1845 to 1846 copybook was keep an eye out for clues or references to artifacts that are now in the Barnum Museum's collection. So far, we've learned about the porcelain dinnerware and gilt silver tea service that Barnum had purchased at an estate auction in Paris. Also, Barnum's first conversations concerning the creation of a guidebook for the American Museum. Our example is from 1849. And most recently, she came across references to General Tom Thumb's little calling cards, of which there are several in the collection. This time, as we make a quick hop over to London, while Barnum undertakes arrangements for the General's return tour, we will learn about the English-made medals, about the size of a U.S. quarter, that were sold as souvenirs. You can see several examples of these medals, as well as smaller brass tokens, in the P.T. Barnum digital collection within the Souvenirs and Toys category. The link is in the show notes. We'll also gain some insights on Barnum's relationship with Charles Stratton, the precocious young boy whom he mentored as General Tom Thumb, and with whom he developed a lifelong friendship. As we've learned from the July to October 1845 correspondence between Barnum and his business associates, the Tom Thumb tour through France, outside of Paris, had not lived up to his expectations of financial reward. The copybook letters begin after the entourage had left Paris, and Barnum's references to the performances there tell us that portion of the tour was extremely successful. The general has nearly killed the people in this part of the country. He has hit them so hard. But as for venues in other parts of the country, well, not so much. Making arrangements at each town had its own particular challenges and frustrations, and the receipts did not amply compensate for all the difficulties, nor even cover the entourage's expenses at times. Barnum was therefore anxious to finish up his tour obligations in France and return to England, certain that he could make up the losses and once again pile up the tin. 
with plans for the tour to close in Paris, with performances of the play Le Petit Poussé running from mid-November to mid-December, Barnum took the opportunity in October to make a brief trip to London to start arranging things there. One of his tasks was ordering more of the souvenir medals that had sold so successfully on the tour through the British Isles in 1844. They were designed and struck by Allen & Moore, a brand-new firm in Birmingham, England, a city famous for manufacturing metal products. Though Barnum had brought metals to France to sell there, too, he did not find a strong market, perhaps because the text on the metals was in English. Certain they would remain popular in England, he aimed to have a supply ready for the tour's return in December, as well as order some to have on hand for Paris. Writing to Messrs. John Allen and Joseph Moore on October 23, 1845, Barnum informed them, I am here for two or three days on a visit. General Tom Thumb is still in France, but will be in England in December. I wish you to strike off 100 or 200 of my museum medals, that is, depicting the American Museum, and send them immediately to my address at Long's Hotel, Bond Street, London. If possible, have them reach there as soon as Saturday next, as I may be off on Sunday. If you can get only 50 ready, it will do just as well. Send also a few dozens of Tom Thumb's new medals with the four ponies, merely for specimens if you can do so conveniently. If not, no matter. He added that he expected to be in Birmingham in December and would pay for them then, also noting, I think we have sufficient medals in France to last us till we arrive here. They don't sell in France as they do in England. Send them even if you don't get them ready till Monday, but I prefer to have them Saturday if possible for fear I might go to France before Monday. Barnum had written to his uncle that while in London, he also planned to pick up something new for my museum, which may explain his uncertain itinerary. The letters to Messrs. Allen and Moore, along with a little research into that company's history, has shed light on the various medals, also referred to as tokens, in the collections of the Barnum Museum and the Bridgeport History Center at the Bridgeport Public Library. The three owned by the Barnum Museum are the earliest, having the date of 1844 and the firm name Allen & Moore on the obverse, front face. Among the three owned by the History Center, two that are similar to the Barnums bear only the name J. Moore on the obverse and have no date. The third must be from about 1864 or later, as it features an image of Charles and his wife Lavinia, with their, borrowed, baby, and the birth dates of the three the babies being December 5, 1863, ten months after the marriage. The J. Moore medals most likely date to the mid or late 1850s, when Moore was in business for himself, since the Allen & Moore partnership went bankrupt. The other clue to a post-1840s date is that Charles's height is given as 31 inches, whereas the 1844 medals give his height as 25 inches, Charles did grow, very slowly, over the course of his life, eventually reaching 42 inches. Though all the medals are worth taking a look at, only the three dated 1844 are relevant to Barnum's letter, in which he mentions one with the American Museum and one with General Tom Thumb's coach and ponies. Barnum did not mention a third one in his letter, a medal featuring Charles's biographical information on the reverse. My guess is that the two with texts on the reverse, Charles's biography and the description of the American Museum, were the first, or among the first, to be made. Possibly preceding those two was a medal with the image of the American Museum on the obverse and its description on the reverse. There is an example in a private collection. I also suspect that when the general was gifted the handsome miniature equipage from the Queen, Barnum decided to have a new medal struck featuring the coach and ponies on the reverse, and this may have supplanted further orders for the biographical version. Also in a private collection, there is another version of the coach and ponies medal with Charles's parents on the obverse, in the distinctive overlapping profile style often used for representing kings and queens on coins. With the exception of the Mr. and Mrs. Stratton with baby depiction, all the medals in the two Bridgeport collections show the same portrait of Charles Stratton on the obverse. The source for this image of him standing on a table next to several books is a print portrait by Charles Bonnier, 1814 to 1886, 
a Belgian artist who worked in London and Paris and was noted for fine portraiture. In 1844, Bonnier drew lithograph portraits of both Barnum seated at a writing desk and Charles standing on a tabletop amidst a variety of objects that provide a sense of scale. You can see both by checking the links in the show notes. Notably, the book standing upright on the stack beside Charles is titled Boyle's Court Guide 1844, alluding to the necessary crash course on royal etiquette prior to meeting Queen Victoria. Even on the medals, you can make out the book title. After that deep dive with the medals, let's now take a look at passages from Barnum's letters concerning Charles. With this copybook, we are witnessing the first few years of a relationship that lasted until Charles' death in 1883. Of course, when Barnum was penning these letters, he had no idea how things would unfold nor for how long, and there are occasional hints that he worried about Charles' health and longevity, and even that Charles's popularity would fade. He often assured his correspondents that the general was first-rate, a popular expression at the time that Charles himself seems to have favored. We have to bear in mind that sickness and death were more common daily worries for people before effective medical treatments existed, and from Barnum's perspective, having lost one daughter to illness in 1844 and perpetually fearful that Helen, his five-year-old, might succumb to disease, his concern about Charles is completely understandable. Charles was, after all, only two years older than little Helen. Notes of paternal fondness for the boy crop up in the letters. Twice so far, Barnum has referred to him as the coon, and in closing a letter to Mr. Stratton from Lyon, he wrote, Respects to all, and especially the coon. He has got a snug saloon to draw and read in, adjoining the bedroom. This passage brought to mind a page in the copybook that contains small drawings, which were almost certainly done by Charles, there is a link in the show notes. It was touching to learn that the seven-and-a-half-year-old liked to draw and read, and that Barnum had considered his comfort when booking hotel rooms at Lyon. Given Barnum's concern for Charles, I have pondered time and again how a young child could be expected to maintain the pace set for his various performances and not suffer frequent meltdowns or exhaustion and illness. A letter to Friend Huey in Paris, written while Barnum was on his short trip to London, gives us an example of the anticipated schedule when the entourage returned to Paris. I wish you to offer the Salle Vivienne people 3,000 francs for their saloon for one month, night and day, commencing the 19th of November or before. Perhaps we would like to commence by the 14th. If they will not accept that, please offer to arrange with the director of Vaudeville Theatre for one month or six weeks, or for two weeks if he prefers it, to play Petit Pousset in the same terms as Monsieur Ancelot gave, one-third recette brute, gross receipts, to play every night, consecutive. Tell the manager that he can announce that General Tom Pousse, being about to depart for America, will pass through Paris and rest there for a limited number of nights only. Thousands of English are now visiting Paris and will be sure to go see Petit Pousset. If the manager accepts the offer, then you may engage Salle Vivienne for the same length of time, at the rate of 1,000 francs per month for the daytime only. Two performances a day, seven days a week, is a lot for anyone, let alone a child. How taxing this was on Charles is hard to say, though he seems to have had good spirit and stamina. In a postscript, Barnum presented Huey with other options to pursue in case none of the aforementioned worked out. He also commented, Salle Vivienne is doubtless the best, as the public knows that was where he appeared before. And we, who already know that Barnum was planning to spend most of 1846 in the British Isles, can chuckle at his sly remark about General Tom Pouce soon returning to America. With thousands of English visiting Paris at the time, Barnum clearly aimed to hook these potential theater-goers with his lure, as they might not bother to see Tom Thumb in Paris if they knew the truth, that they could see him later on in London. As always, Barnum was determined to be successful and left no promotional tactic or income-generating opportunity unturned. Pantomime Engagements for the Holidays 
On October 27, 1845, while on a brief trip to London, Barnum wrote to two gentlemen with the idea of setting up engagements for General Tom Thumb to perform in December during the holiday season. The general's entourage was then currently in the south of France and expected to conclude the tour of Paris the following month, then return to England for at least one more season before going back to America. Barnum, acting as advance man, had left Lyon and hurried to London for a few days to attend to business for the American Museum, in addition to making arrangements for continuing the general's tour. It is fortunate for us, reading these letters 175 years later, that Barnum was seeking new opportunities, because his letters of inquiry had to describe the general's performances with reasonable detail. The two one-page letters provide some tantalizing descriptions, despite their brevity. Barnum noted in his letter to a Mr. Webster, I am here for two days only, but it has just struck me that perhaps it might be for our mutual interests to arrange for the general to appear in the Christmas pantomime at your or the Adelphi Theater. If you think favorably of it, I should like to call on you at any hour you name tomorrow. To provide context on what Barnum was proposing, let's take a quick look at the British definition of pantomime, since it has a more specific meaning than in the U.S., where it is understood simply as an entertainment performed without words. In England, a pantomime is defined as a theatrical entertainment, mainly for children, that involves music, topical jokes, and slapstick comedy and is based on a fairy tale or nursery story usually produced around Christmas. This definition aligns well with Tom Thumb's performances in France, which today we would probably liken to variety shows. The entertainment included a play based on a fairy tale, plus music, comedy, various characters in costume, and even what could be called pantomime in the form of Tom Thumb's academic poses, mimicking classical sculptures. Beginning with a description of the play, Barnum told Webster, A simple translation of his French play of Petit Pousset, played 63 consecutive nights at the Vaudeville Theatre Paris, would be nearly all that would be required. It is a gaudy taking piece, full of most laughable incidents, and the music, as we say in America, is first rate. Barnum elaborated further in a letter to a Mr. Byrne, telling him, The music is capital, and the changes and transformations good, rich, and effective. The play is by Messieurs Dumanois and Clairville, Paris. Impressing upon Webster and Byrne that he, Barnum, would supply all the props for the Christmas pantomime, Barnum told Webster that the accessories, now being transported town to town in France, weighed a couple of tons. To Byrne, he stated, We have all the accessories of the piece weighing one and a half tons, and have taken them in a posting vehicle to Bruxelles, Toulouse, Bordeaux, Marseille, Rouen, Lyon, etc., where he has played with amazing success in the principal theaters. The letter to Webster also included details about the accessories and acts. Among the rest is his little palace and furniture, all, including the candelabra, being of the most gorgeous description, the latter being brass gilt, so as to do for service as well as show. The general assumes several characters in the piece, among which is Frederick the Great, in which he mounts his war steed, pony, and goes in pursuit of the ogre. He also appears in a pie, in the giant's boots which he draws from the giant's foot while asleep, in a soup pot on the stove, etc., 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 etc. Barnum noted to Byrne that the little general's palace is elegantly furnished. His equipage, consisting of four ponies, carriage, coachee, and footmen, are all quite the thing for a Christmas pantomime. He explained to Webster, His little equipage also appears in the play carriage drawn by four ponies, with Kochi and Tiger and livery, etc. There is much acting by the general, and he cannot be beat by old or young, great or small, in pantomime, or anything else appertaining to his business. To both men, Barnum named similar terms, telling Burns, The general would require 50 pounds per night, or such a share as would give him that or more if he filled the theater nightly, which I am sure would be the case. He informed Webster, I should want such terms as would give us about 50 pounds per night, rather more than less, provided the theater was jammed full during each night of his engagement. That part of the story I would be willing to risk. Since Barnum intended to leave for Paris the following evening, he asked both to send him messages right away. 
a single line addressed to me, 25 Rupert Street, Haymarket, indicating interest or not in pursuing the proposal. He added that he would be willing to meet at any hour you name, but if you do not think it an object, I shall be just as well satisfied. Having returned to Paris on October 31st, Barnum wrote a long letter to Sherwood Stratton, who was at that moment in Lyon with his wife Cynthia and son Charles, General Tom Thumb, as well as the nine or ten others that made up the entourage. Among the several topics Barnum covered was the very practical issue of transporting and shipping the one and a half to two tons of accessories and equipment he had boasted of in his letters to Webster and Byrne. Certainly, it could become a costly endeavor if a strategy and management plan were not thought through, so Barnum presented some options, informing Stratton that the props would not be needed for their next engagement in Paris. He suggested that what could reasonably be shipped should be sent from Lyon. He wrote, I think it can be done by steamboat to Marseille, and from there by ship to London. I am very confident that it would be better to burn the wagon and house and furniture than to pay the expense of posting all the way through Paris to Havre. Advising Stratton on what to keep and what to sell or dispose of, he wrote, If you have not yet begun to have the old baggage wagon mended, I half think you had better sell it and throw away the little house and ship the big box of furniture for London, or perhaps ship the house also, unless the freight will cost more than the house is worth. You can easily learn the best way to ship the stuff to London from Lyon. Monsieur Pinte can go with you and learn the whole particulars from any large merchants in Lyon. Indeed, I expect any of the Yankees in your hotel can tell you. Should disposal of the little house become necessary due to high shipping costs, Barnum planned to have another made in England. He told Stratton they would also need to sell the vehicles. He advised selling the post-chase in Lyon, and then selling the posting carriage in Paris, for even on that we should have to pay duty in England and a damned sight for freight. He did note one exception. We will hang on to the pony wagon only. This was for transporting the four ponies that drew the miniature coach. Preparing to wrap up the tour of France earlier than had been planned, though still keeping engagements in Paris, Barnum met with Monsieur Roux in Paris, an agent whom he disliked but needed to work with. In order to leave the country legally, not having fulfilled contracts for five other cities, Barnum would have to pay Monsieur Roux to get the outstanding treaties settled. In addition, the financial arrangement Barnum had with Roux regarding a play created for Tom Thumb, Légion, had to be settled because they had failed to perform it while on tour. You may recall that some of the theater directors told Barnum it was not a good piece, and thus would not have it at their theaters, a fact that Barnum rather gleefully reported to Roux, though it did not get him off the hook. Surely it was with some relief that Barnum thus told Stratton, I have also settled with Roux to give him 1,000 francs if he settles all the treaties at present existing, Strasbourg, Nancy, Hamburg, Anvers, Brussels, etc., and this also pays for him all loss which he suffered by his play of the Gion, and also pays him all which he might have expected in the shape of a present from us for his agency. So now, all is settled. But there is more to the story than this. On the same day Barnum penned his letter to Sherwood Stratton from Paris, he also wrote to Mr. Sherman, the antiquarian and preceptor to young Charles Stratton. Beginning in haste with the warning that he had only ten minutes to write, he announced that he was running off to sign a treaty with Salle Vivienne. That venue sounds promising, but the next lines are rather alarming. Charles was unwell and could no longer perform the play Petit Pousset. Putting two and two together, however, we quickly see this doesn't add up, because Barnum had been away from Charles for a very long stretch and would have no such knowledge of his health, whereas Sherman was actually with Charles. This was a concocted story Barnum was feeding Sherman in order to provide a rational explanation for backing out on the contracts in the cities noted above. He wrote to Sherman, The general must not play Petit Pousset in France after Lyon, because his health is so bad that he cannot possibly play Petit Pousset, and on that account we shall not be able to go to the theaters where we are engaged. I am very sorry to disappoint the managers. But, you know, when a person is in such delicate health as the general is, we must, much against our wills, give up the treaties. I am thankful he is able to do his other exercises. 
But that is not proof that he could play Petit Pousset, for that is much harder for him. Besides, the great cold theaters and the change of his costume give him such colds that we must give it up. How sorry I am that we can't go to Nancy and Strasbourg and Anvers and Brussels, etc. Echoing the shipping instructions he had given to Stratton, minus the question of casting off the little palace, and again suggesting that burning the wagon was preferable to bringing it to Paris, Barnum signed off with the mention of popular writer Albert Smith, 1816 to 1860, who is doing Petit Pousset for England. Presumably, that meant Barnum had gone ahead and hired Smith to translate the play, in anticipation of the general being engaged to perform Christmas pantomimes in London. Smith also revised the play Hop O' My Thumb for Charles to perform a few months later, which he did in London in March and May of 1846. Had Barnum sealed a deal with the gentleman in London before he returned to France? Another twist to the story. Stay tuned. Thanks for listening to this episode of Becoming Barnum, The Journey to Fame and Fortune. This podcast was produced by the Barnum Museum. All episodes are based on the blog series Barnum's Letters from Abroad by Adrian St. Pierre, curator of the Barnum Museum. Editing and sound design are by Rui Pino, and narration by William Saris. Kathleen Marr is our executive director, and John Swing is our chief operations officer. Please visit our website at www.barnum-museum.org to learn more about the museum. Don't forget to connect with us on social media and visit the Barnum Museum's YouTube channel for behind-the-scenes presentations of our fascinating collections and more stories about the legendary showman. Please tune in next time as we continue our adventures in Europe with P.T. Barnum.